Prior to diving into the world of Voron, I hadn't put much thought into bed preheating or heat soaking my printer's enclosure. I was so used to just setting the temperature in my slicer and letting the printer start as soon as it hit that temperature. For most filaments, that workflow is not going to be a problem, but when we're talking about large parts in more warp prone filaments or an entire bed of parts, then the bed temperature and the chamber temperature becomes much more important. With some of my recent printer builds using very thick aluminum plates for the beds, I was really curious as to what the temperature reading was on the top of the printer where I'm actually printing compared to what the temperature sensor was reading on the bottom of the printer. So last month, I picked up a four temperature thermocouple thermometer to find out just that. In this video, we will test out a few different bed and heater types to see just how much the temperatures vary. We'll also use a thermal camera to see how even the heating is on these different beds. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Today's video is sponsored by PCBWay. PCBWay is your one-stop shop for PCB fabrication, 3D printing, and CNC services. Their 3D printing services include everything from FDM, SLA, SLS, and even SLM technologies. I tested out both their nylon SLS as well as aluminum SLM printing and was blown away by the results. For PCB fabrications, they offer both bare and populated boards. They even have a section for open source community projects for quickly sharing designs. Links are in the description below so that you can find out more and check out all that they have to offer. Jumping right in, we are starting with my recently built LDO Voron 2.4. With the bed and flex plate, it comes in just shy of 14 millimeters thick. This is the Rev-C version of the 2.4 kit, so it comes with LDO's edge-to-edge -edge silicone heater. To keep things simple, I started by just attaching one of the temperature sensors to the center of the bed, and I used a couple pieces of Kapton tape to hold it in place. I then set the bed to 100 Celsius, which is what I typically use for ABS, and began monitoring the temps. Just about instantly, the thermistor sensor on the bottom of the bed began outrunning my added sensor on the top. This is roughly what I was expecting, but I didn't expect the range to get so high. Once things got going, the average difference in temperature from bottom to top was right at 20 Celsius. By the time the bed showed the target temperature of 100 Celsius, the top of the bed was reading 25 Celsius lower. I then started a stopwatch to see just how long it would take for the top to reach that 100C. I was pretty surprised to see the temperature hit 81 Celsius 8 minutes in and stall there. At this point, it would rise a fraction of a Celsius and fall right back down. Since this first test had been ran with the front doors open, I let the temperature drop for about an hour, shut the doors, and ran it once more. Once again, I was surprised to see very little difference with the doors shut. At 100 Celsius underneath, the top read 77 Celsius, so I started my stopwatch again, and roughly 8 minutes in, we capped at 85 Celsius. Although small, this was an improvement of 4 Celsius compared to the initial test we ran with the front doors open. For a final test, I hooked up two additional sensors, one to the far left of the bed and one at the very back to see if there was much difference in bed temperature from the center. The middle and far left ended up being the closest at roughly 1 Celsius apart, with the back trailing by a few. The spread was not substantial, but this is what I was expecting considering this LDO kit comes with the edge-to-edge -edge heater, so the entire build plate should relatively be heated evenly. Last month, Pergear reached out to me letting me know they had a new thermal camera called the Infrared P2 Pro and sent it over for testing. One thing I really liked about it compared to my existing thermal camera is that it just uses your phone's power instead of requiring its own charge. I got the iOS version, but they also have a USB-C option for Android that I will have linked in the description below. Using the thermal camera to see an image of the 2.4's bed, heating looks pretty even across the entire plate. Edges did show a couple C lower, which makes sense given the value from our sensor at the back of the plate. I also got to see how much cooler the top side of the capped on tape was when trying to get a reading of the center of the bed. Next up, we have my original self-sourced Voron 0.1. The bed on this printer is roughly 8.5 millimeters thick, and it does not have an edge-to-edge -edge heater. I was curious to see how this would affect anything. Once again, I hooked up the three sensors to the center, the side, and the back, and I set the bed to 100 Celsius. Similarly, the bed temperature shot up, leaving the top of the bed trailing by 20 to 25 Celsius very quickly. When the bed registered 100C, the top of the bed showed between 70 and 75 Celsius. 
After another eight minutes of heating, the top capped at 85C in the side and the center with the back sensor reading between 76 and 77 Celsius. Using the thermal camera, it did verify the center and side being closer in temperature than the very back, but the distance wasn't quite as far. I'm thinking that either the capped on tape just wasn't holding the sensor down quite as well onto the bed, or because the back of the bed are where the thermistor and the heater wires come out, that maybe that section is just the cooler part of the bed. Lastly, I pulled out my Voron switch wire. Unlike the other two, this one is using a much thinner PCB bed heater. Heater and flex plate combined on this is right under four millimeters. Before I hooked up the sensors on this bed, I did use some IPA to clean the bed in hopes that the Kapton would adhere a bit better. Then, once again, I set the temperatures to 100 Celsius and I sat back. Unlike the previous two, the temperature reading on the top of the bed was much closer to what the printer was actually reading. Up until 65 Celsius, the difference was right at 5C. At that point, the top began to heavily fall behind the bottom's reading, and at 100 Celsius on the printer, the top was at 83C all around, which ended up being the highest it went before stalling. This thin bed did hit its max temps quicker than the thicker beds. It took about an extra minute or two once the bed had hit 100C, compared to the other printers with the thicker aluminum beds needing about eight minutes each. This does make sense given the massive difference between this thin four millimeter bed and the 14 millimeter bed of the Voron 2.4. Although the three sensors we placed gave us pretty close readings, using the thermal camera, this PCB bed heater had the most variance in temperature. Certain edges were quite a bit colder, and overall the temperature seemed much less uniform than that of the silicone heaters. Although the thicker beds take longer to heat up, once heated they should be less susceptible to sudden changes given the heat that they have built up. This also proved true when I tried to cool down the bed on the 2.4 in between my tests and it took anywhere between 45 minutes and an hour just to get it back down to room temperature. So what would I say we learned from this? Well, for one, I had no idea that the temperature on the underside of the bed and the top side of the bed on printers I'm using fairly often had a 15 Celsius difference. I always assumed it trailed behind at least by a bit, but this was definitely much more of a spread. And I also thought that shortly after it would reach the same temperature on the bottom, but that just wasn't the case. Granted, I did just let those thicker beds heat for roughly eight minutes and not 30 minutes or an hour, but given that they were stalling and even dropping down in temperature in some instances, I have a hard time believing that they would have climbed even after an extended period of time without the addition of something like an internal chamber heater. Lastly, this does show that at least on a thicker bed, preheating is definitely not a bad idea. At eight minutes of preheating on the thicker beds, we were able to squeeze another seven to 10 Celsius out of the top surface, which can be quite substantial when we're talking about printing with warp prone materials, especially if you're already having some adhesion issues. This doesn't consider the added benefits you'd get from preheating your bed in an enclosed printer, which then in turn warms the air inside of that enclosure, which can help with things also like warping, with cracking of parts, and with the inner layer adhesion. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if nothing else, it gave you some things to consider. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below, and also let me know if you were expecting these results, or if like me, this was even bigger of a difference than you had initially thought. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll have links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.